know the NHS treats menopause, but how does the NHS treat its workers that are going through menopause? We're going to find out today. My name's Kate Muir. I've made two menopause documentaries with Davina McCall for Channel 4, and I've written a book called Everything You Need to Know About the Menopause, But We're Too Afraid to Ask. Anyway, today we're going to ask the difficult questions, and the people we're going to speak to are key workers, NHS workers, all from the Derby area. Um, I had my hysterectomy last year, um, in the May, for endometriosis and adhesions which was great, worked absolutely fine, no pain afterwards um, and was plunged into surgical menopause. I was discharged from hospital with a 50 patch um, of oestrogen HRT and within a couple of weeks it was like a plane crash. The symptoms were horrendous, absolutely horrendous. I thought I was going to be sectioned, arrested, on the brink of suicide. That's, that's the bottom line of how bad it was. I think I masked it at work quite well. Um, at home it was a nightmare, I had no patience, no tolerance. I was shouting at the kids, at my husband all the time. Um, I would sit in the bedroom a lot on the night time and just cry, basically. For no reason at all, just... I felt like I was losing my mind. Aww. It was quite emotional. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't good at all. Surgical menopause differs for women because actually what's happened is, and I'm going to say this in very layman term, the minute we remove your womb and your ovaries, for whatever reason that might be, we are physically as doctors going in and taking that away from you. So your hub that produces your hormones, there's lovely estrogen, progesterone, and the third hormone that gets a little talked about, which is testosterone. So the minute we remove your ovaries, you are plunged into surgical menopause. And when that happens, your hormones deplete themselves because obviously we've taken them out. And then you get all the menopausal symptoms such as hot flushes, night sweats, irritability, palpitations, vaginal symptoms that might come up two or three weeks later. The, the theory and the mistake that we make is that we forget to tell women that this is going to happen to them. Were you given a leaflet? No. No leaflet. No patient information on surgical menopause. So you were left high and dry? Yeah. I work in the hospital where there's a menopause clinic and didn't even know it existed. And it was my GP that had to refer me. I, I, would, I would be all right for a couple of weeks and then a, a new symptom would come in. So then I started to put it up. Then I went back to the GP and asked for the gel again because of my friend making me aware that there was another form of HRT I could use as well. So I started adding that into the mix. Um, I also had testosterone prescribed to me, but I had to go to the hospital to who it was that did my surgery to authorise a prescription for testosterone. I wasn't even aware that I needed testosterone at the time. I did that in. Um, then I was told obviously about uh, vaginal pessaries. I did that in. I um, was on citralopram as well at the time because when I was really struggling to start without any help, I was solo, I needed something to keep me going, to fight the battle that I knew I was uh, heading into. Tell me a little bit about the testosterone. Libido went through the roof, massively, from not wanting to have sex for a couple of years before I had my hysterectomy anyway, with all the problems with endometriosis and you know, the problems that come with that and then your moods and everything. Having that, it was like being born again virgin. It's the only way I can describe it, <laughs> in all honesty. Um, yeah, it, it, massive, massive change to your mood, libido. And then there's obviously all the other things it does in the background, you know, with bone health and everything like that. So yeah, everybody should be on it. There's a real argument to, made, to be made that testosterone is a vital hormone. What happens at the moment is that there's a lot of debate around this. In the British Menopause Society, they recognise that the only reason we would need testosterone is for libido. But there's more and more research coming through, and this is where we do need more research in women's health. Um, and that I, tracks back to a lot of um, gender bias research, unfortunately. 
But when it comes to testosterone therapy, we need it for our cognitive function, um, our bone strength, our fatigue levels and our energy levels as well, as you were saying. Despite having estrogen, she still felt that she was very, very fatigued and tired. And then also we know that it really helps with our vulval and vaginal health as well. So the whole overall well-being, you know, testosterone is a, is a steroid hormone. It gives us our get up and go. It gives us our va va voom, as some women say. And that is exactly how I liken to it at all as well. For some of my women who, especially if they're POI and surgical menopause, honestly, it's like the lights go on. I was way, way too young <laughs> to be to be getting there. So yeah, it just in hindsight now I can start working and uh, recognizing that what I was experiencing at the time uh, were the perimenopausal symptoms. Um, I couldn't sleep, so at the time I was a ward manager, so I would be at work at four o'clock in the morning simply because I couldn't sleep. And if you can't sleep, what else do you do? I just go to work. Um, I was tearful. I would lock myself in the office and cry over every little thing. I lost confidence. Um, I wasn't performing as well as I could. I was getting more um, um, frustrated, more angry <laughs> at everybody, at everything. Um, I was still having periods, so it never crossed my mind that it could be anything to do with the menopause. And uh, because it's not, uh, menopause is not something that was covered during my nurse training. And um, even now it's not something that was covered during my advanced uh, nurse training. And I was having recurrent thrush, or what I thought was thrush. Um, I was dry <laughs> down below, sex was painful, and I just didn't want to have it. And um, my husband at the time didn't really get it or understand it. And uh, it just became too frustrating for me and for him. That's when I realized that wasn't the marriage I wanted to be. There was no support or anything. I still didn't recognize the menopause or anything. Um, I moved out and um, it just, broke everything. So a woman who's able to have a good night's sleep because she's on the good dose of HRT, her marital relationship is able to survive. She's able to stay in work longer, be financially de independent on herself. And she's not thinking about making that hard decision of, do I leave my career? Because unfortunately we do see women leave their career at that stage of when they're transitioning through the perimenopause. But I do wonder as a GP, how many times I've had to sit in my consultation room and counsel my patient who works in the NHS themselves about saying, you know, I'm working 12 hours, I'm working night shifts, but the night sweats and the hot flushes make it impossible and making that decision of leaving their career. And that I've had to do not time and time again. I had a hemorrhage when I was working on a 12 hour shift and I, it, it just happened, I, I, I was working, I was about to uh, wash a patient and all of a sudden I had this massive flood, a flooding feeling and I had to excuse myself and go to the toilet and I was gone for a prolonged time. When I came back, the nurse in charge um, of that particular area wasn't very happy with me being missing for a while. She said I was putting patient safety at risk. I went off the ward and I had blood down to my knees. I ended up in A&E because it wouldn't stop and I then ended up in the women's health unit and they put me on norethisterone and I've been on norethisterone now for over a year. You were working on the ward, Tommy, but you're now a community nurse. Was that to do with your health as well? I was struggling on the wall, but it was not ultimately what I wanted to do, but I was struggling and that was ultimately, you know, one of the decisions that made me go into community. I was, I was struggling and I, I was forgetting things. I was having brain fog like now. Um, I was having um, fatigue issues, massive fatigue issues, um, m motivation, lack of motivation. I was as flat as a pancake. When you are, are transitioning through from perimenopause 
um, to menopause and then postmenopause because the psychological symptoms are the most underrated. And I find that more so in my South Asian communities because it's such a taboo. But also sometimes I see that in my NHS colleagues as well because we never like to admit that we have a psychological issue or that our mental well-being is impacted um, because the instant thing is, is that that will affect or people will think that my clinical judgment for my patient or my ability to practice isn't enough. It's actually one of the biggest stumbling blocks, um, your capacity to work. Oestrogen and progesterone are decreasing. We know that that impacts on our mental health. So anxiety, depression, low mood, um, irritability. You might even get tearfulness for no reason, loss of confidence, memory fog, forgetfulness, lack of sleep, insomnia. I am thinking about looking at HRT, but at the minute I thought I'd try and throw everything else at it. So um, I do a... Um, exercise program that's sort of designed for women uh, going through the perimenopause so quite a lot of strength training and things and as part of that um, I in September I did a couple of weeks of a sort of kind of perimenopause specific reset where I gave up I mean I basically gave up everything you know caffeine sugar alcohol um, gluten all sorts of things um, and the good news was it made quite a difference to some of my symptoms um, all night sweats and hot flushes and i've and i slept better that is equally bad news isn't it because um life without all of those things would be really difficult for me so i have to confess i have had a couple of drinks since but i have given up on the caffeine don't wait until you're on your knees and then ask for support. The data and the studies show that women in perimenopause who start hormone replacement therapy for night sweats, hot flushes, palpitations, so all those menopausal symptoms, brain fog particularly earlier on, the better long-term effect that they have. So there's newer nuanced research that's coming out to show that if you start it for brain fog in women who are perimenopause, the numbers in the CT scans are showing that there's a lower risk of dementia later on. If you start women who have um, menopausal symptoms earlier on in perimenopause, they are more likely to exercise better, therefore keep their weight down, therefore better cardiovascular health and lower risk of diabetes in the future. So, I, you know, to me as a doctor, that's preventative medicine right there for you. I find that at the top of my mind when somebody, when a woman in their 40s, comes in and they are talking about uh, one, two, three type of symptoms. I've already got alarm bells going. And if I look at their notes and they've had two, three consultations about the same problem, I'm thinking, well, I think it's a menopause or perimenopause. Um, so it's being able to think about it, be aware of it and bring it up with the person, with the patient when they are sitting in front of us. But think about a place like here in Derby city centre, there will be a lot of Asian um, black um, uh, women who, are, who will not have access or easy access to a lot of this information. How do we get um, ethnic minority or, or communities which are hard to reach, and I hate that because they're not hard to reach. I mean, look at me, I'm not under a rock and I'm an ethnic minority, <laughs> but we are hardly reached. And the reason we're hardly reached is because there's two folds to that argument. One is, is that in our communities, there is a hesitancy of talking anything that is gynecological related because it's highly sexualized. You can talk about breast cancer, and the minute you talk about breast, it's a sexualized conversation. And we have something in our Asian communities which is called Parde ke niche rakna, which in Punjabi means keeping under the veil. And that is sort of very much within a lot of ethnic minority communities who will understand that concept. The other concept we have in our communities is log kya kahenge, what will other people think? And well, what will people say? When you have those two hindrances, they're major hindrances, it's very, very hard to get over that. So to talk about something that is so personal and also puts you into the bracket of being older is really hard to do. So we don't talk about it in our household. There's a wall of silence that forms, so we don't then seek the help. If you're then really happy that your periods are going to stop, because if you're from a conservative Muslim community or Hindu or Sikh community, access to the temple, the mosque, um, the Gurdwara might not be there for you while you're on your period. So to have this phase in your life coming up where your periods stop is a time to rejoice. 
So the problems that the GP sees are not in keeping with those underserved communities. I haven't seen any research at all that has been done in the UK on um, black and Asian women and how much it affects them. But I think it's as big as it affects everybody else. It's probably not um, recognized, not because it's not there, but because people are not aware and it's still taboo in most communities and they just accept it and uh, live with the symptoms. My one top tip for any women is please, please have a look at the symptom list of menopausal symptoms. You can print those off, they're available online or Google them um, because that is going to be the bit that underpins your treatment. Remember, in perimenopause, a blood test after the age of 45 um, isn't necessary for female hormone blood tests because it doesn't add anything and it's a waste of money. So please don't waste even privately money doing tests for FSH or LH, which are your female hormone blood tests. Women below the age of 45, even then their blood tests could be normal. So therefore, the thing that underpins whether we start management or treatment is your symptoms. So what happened with your cancer and menopause? So in 2005, I gave birth to a healthy baby boy um, in the June. And after quite a lot of complications, four months following his birth, um, I went to the doctors because I had continuous bleeding. They said there was nothing to be concerned of but referred me to the hospital, where through lots of tests, I was then diagnosed with stage 3B cervical cancer. I then found out that this had spread, so the typical hysterectomy was not an option for me, and I had to go down the route of having chemotherapy, brachiotherapy and radiotherapy with my four-month-old baby. Um, this then, I was then told that this would be induced, inducing the menopause, um, to which that was all I was told, and had to basically get on with it. I then started my radiotherapy and chemotherapy and quite quickly that brought on menopausal symptoms so hot flushes, um, months down the line mood swings, things that I actually weren't spoken to about. It was just I was going to go through menopause and needed to go on HRT and, and that was all the information I had. There was never any leaflets in a clinic, nothing was ever really discussed and I was 26. So I did go to my consultant on one of my three month, six monthly checkups and I had a blood test and he sat down and said, this is your bloods and this is what a normal 26 year old blood should look like and you're not anywhere near them so we need to start HRT. So with that I went on to a, a, a tablet called Tibalone. How did you learn about, you say body identical HRT? So we're part of a menopause cafe within the hospital. Um, I was, um, I came across it as part of the wellbeing centre within the trust um, and linked up with staff um, to become support for running of the cafe. And from that we've had lots of women now um, come into this and it's developed quite quickly. Um, there's more people talking about treatments and I think it's that that's opened my mind into thinking there's a lot more options out there for me rather than tib alone because I understand the risks of what that might mean for me going on it plus 40 years um, and the cafe is a free open space for everybody to have a discussion um, and one of the biggest topics I think is the treatment for menopause. I love giving my patients body identical hormone replacement therapy. So that could be your estrogel, your patches, your spray, something that's gonna go onto the skin, talks to the fat cells and gets then taken into the bloodstream is far better than taking something orally, which is synthetic, goes through the liver and then triggers off your clotting factors and has other com complications with it. Whereas body identical isn't synthetic and therefore a low risk prof profile in regards to clots and dare I say, in some cases, even breast cancer, because if you're taking estrogen only, then there is, the data shows that it doesn't increase your risk of breast cancer. And the younger women, again, doesn't increase your risk of breast cancer. So it's really important to get that information across to women. And then having micronized progesterone, such as eutrogestan, which is again, body identical. So a lower risk profile in regards to clots that women can have, which actually means that if you're doing 
and advocating for body identical systemic HRT, then more women can have it. So gone are the old days of saying, well, if you have high blood pressure, if you're diabetic, if you're overweight, if you have a family history of breast cancer, then or if you've got migraines, then having hormone replacement therapy is not for you. Well, actually, it is for you. Tell me about the Menopause Cafe and how it's changed the conversation here. There's not enough awareness about cervical cancer and there's not enough awareness about menopause support. Um, we've spoke about hair loss, we've spoke about weight gain, we've spoke about treatments, um, everything that anybody could possibly think of. What I do like is that people feel safe to talk about it. People don't feel embarrassed to say, I'm losing my hair. That was a big thing for me, losing a lot of my hair. It just was falling out when brushing it. Um, and you can see people's relief. So somebody will say, does anybody keep losing their hair? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's an echo effect. And that seems to be the same throughout every single different conversation we have on the cafe. Um, but every month we are getting new members, the posters are going up, there's more recognition in the trust and it's just about us having the time to get the message out there and if you speak to anybody, there's a relation straight away and a lot of people don't know about it and it's fundamentally so important that we get that message out to all the people and all the ladies in this trust. Okay, so should we should we make a start? Yeah. Hi, I'm Helen. Um, I'm a PA. Um, this I came because Nicola invited me. Um, I've been to one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've been um, recruiting. <laughs> I didn't pay for it. Following, following conversations about Nicola, she knows I've been sort of suffering. Um, and yeah, just good for information. Um, hi, Tara. I work in the Research and Sim team in Burton. Specifically made sure I wanted to come along. Never been to one of these before, but part of the menopause group and suffering massively. So wanted to just find out more, <laughs> just to help on the journey. It's really amazing that more people are talking about it, more people know about it, and people of all ages and genders should know about it. So that's why I like coming. <laughs> I had heart palpitations mm. and I went for an ECG. I would wake up at four in the morning and go, <laughs> um, and I went in and they stuck things all over me. And then they said, You're perfectly all right, you're a runner, you're not, not going to have a heart attack. I said, But I have a heart attack every night. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then I went on HRT, and two days later, my heart attack stopped. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's, it's just mad, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I mean it, and that's so common, it's like 41% of women get little ones. It's not like, I was even weird, but I'd never heard of it. They've never heard of it. They must have spent all that money. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's really funny, actually, because I have them. If you're getting palpitations, physical symptoms, your mood is really affected, then you're not going to be able to perform to the best of your ability. To be able to support our colleagues, we have to do more than just say, well, open a window or have a fan. Is it cooler or not? It's not tight around your neck, it's looser, it's horribly thick. I think creating as many opportunities as we can for colleagues to come together um, for peer support, share their experience of the workplace and support each other is really important. Menopause being one of the big ticket items in particular. How do you feel being the only man at the Menopause Cafe? Oh yeah, good question, yeah. I think it's really important that we engage as many male colleagues as we can in conversation. Um, I think personally being involved in the face-to-face the, the -face, um, cafe today were interesting to people's stories. I think it's, you know, we talk about it quite a lot within our sort of service team, how we best support people, how we might develop initiatives, how we might bring cafes and things together strategically. I think in doing so you sometimes remove yourself from the arts and mind piece of what it's actually like for people working in the workplace, living through the menopause and experiencing it first hand. All our jobs are cognitively very demanding and a lot of them are very physically demanding as well. Um, so you put those two things together, um, I think we need to uh, educate, signpost, and then as you say, maybe there are more things we can do to use the resources we've got to get our staff access to the right help as quickly as we can. This is a movement being driven 
by the people suffering and you know official you know, medical training nhs information is going to have to catch up because it's out of step now with where women are in terms of the their expectations and the demands that they're going to be putting on the nhs but it comes back to well what can we do for our workforce we can get them access to really really good comprehensive personalized information quickly can't we while we wait and lobby um, to get the kind of national information sources for, for the broader public um, updated and changed. If I became the menopause czar, number one, I would treat it just as we do with pregnancy uh, in the NHS. Women would be advocating for themselves, but also employment. Our employers in HR would be completely going, yes, we need to educate you because this time of stage in your life will come. So know all the menopausal symptoms, know where support is available in your workplace, um, and also be able to get appointments with your healthcare provider in order to go through the symptoms and get treatment early on. That's number one. Number two, I would love as a, a HR are to have a national formulary. I'm obviously motivated to change the agenda on menopause in the NHS. I think we've had loads and loads of staff come forwards um, really to explain their menopause journey in the workplace. The plan from here on in is that we're going to establish a menopause treatment service for staff across Derbyshire. I think it's really important to have equity. We know that you know, some of our colleagues are able to get treatment from their GPs and others aren't. Um, so we want to extend the hours at which people can get treatment. Um, so the plan is that we will have a service that runs in the evenings and weekends, which will allow our staff that do work 24-7 to access treatment at times that they might not be otherwise able to. We will look to introduce a service specifically for underrepresented groups. So we'll be looking at the trans community, um, also our black and ethnic minority colleagues um, who we know are not openly accessing treatment for menopause. Eventually I'd like to see some of the initiatives that we're rolling out, like the menopause treatment service, to be rolled out nationally so that there is a standard and that everyone can expect the same level of treatment and not have the difficulties that they are at the moment. I'm still a nurse through and through, um, but I'm also in the Army Reserves. I joined um, the Reserves in 2009 and uh, commissioned straight as a captain. And um, I am now a major. Um, yeah, so it's fantastic to be able to have the best of both worlds, really, um, working as a nurse in the NHS and in the Army. I know. Uh, when I was going through the menopause, I nearly left the army just because I couldn't, I felt that I couldn't function um, as an officer. I couldn't make decisions the way I should and um, because I couldn't talk to anybody and nobody recognized what I was going through. The more we can normalize it, um and signpost people to support uh, the better. I talk about it everywhere I go. Um, half the women in my department where I work, you know, they're all having battles with even getting the GPs to entertain them, really. Um, so I'm fighting the battles for them on the phone. Um, I've created a women's group in my area. Major topic has been menopause. I've read enough to understand that the new advances in HRT are safer and safer, more appropriate for more and more people. And when I look at colleagues, friends, family who are on HRT, um, it seems to make an incredible difference. So why wouldn't you? I think there has to be a, an element of personal choice in it. And um, I'm not saying I won't explore that option, but you need to do it in your own time. If you want your workplace team to work and be productive for you and that's the whole aim wherever you are in life and to get better and better and better then you need to care about perimenopause and menopause. We need to talk about the menopause and we need to know it's about metamorphosis not misery it's about a good way through change and sometimes we need a little help from a friend to get through that.